Breakups are arguably one of the worst parts of life for a physical human. We associate them with incredible pain and loss. Of course we do, because they threaten our sense of connection, which is, you know, only the number one need we have in life. <laughs> the thing is, is that a lot of why we associate so much pain with breakups is because of the way that we've been trained that breakups should go or do go. But a lot of this expectation we hold of breakups is actually based off of watching highly unconscious people split up and then destroy each other's lives specifically to avoid their own shame. There is another way. There's a way that we can transform or transition a relationship that feels bad into a relationship with that same person that feels good. The majority of this video is going to be about how to go about doing this, but before I do that, I'm going to tell you something. I have had so many breakups. Breakups with romantic partners, breakups with employees, breakups with colleagues, breakups with friends, all kinds of things. Now some of these breakups have gone exactly as you would expect a traditional relationship to go, horribly. Others have gone wonderfully. I have a lot of people who no longer work for me that I'm super close to still. My former fiancé has now lived with me in the same intentional community for 16 years. And through many ups and downs, we're closer now than we've ever been. My former husband and the father of my son is also still an intentional community member of mine. We spend time together every single week and are strong advocates for each other's well-being as well as our son's. And believe it or not, the two of them are super close to each other as well. Here's the thing. Because of all this experience I have, I've worked out the variables. I understand at this point what works and what doesn't, and why. And in this episode, I'm going to break it all down for you, so that you totally understand it. The following points that I'm going to give you, they actually apply to any relationship. Whether that breakup, or whatever you want to call it, is relative to a friend, or a romantic partner, or a business colleague, or whatever it is. However, for the sake of cohesion in this particular episode, I'm going to keep most of my examples and most of my orientation in the direction of romantic relationships. 1. While we're on the topic of how to break up and make somebody a friend, you have to make sure you actually want to be friends. Now, there are a great many relationships and many reasons why we're attracted to certain people, and the reality is we may actually dislike a person immensely and not even want to be friends with them at all. If you don't want to be friends with somebody, this ain't going to work. Genuine friendship is based on love. It is a love where you take the other person as a part of yourself and you're genuinely committed to their well-being and love for who they really are. The thing is, when a lot of people say that they want to transition a relationship into a friendship, they don't actually want a friendship at all. What they want is to buffer themselves against the potential consequences of a breakup. They want to buffer themselves for the sense of their own security. This is completely and totally self-serving. So it's really not that they love the other person and want to take them as part of themselves. They're just trying to preserve themselves in that moment. Now when this is the case, this is not going to work to try to create a friendship after a breakup. In fact, it's a super short-term and temporarily lived thing, because the second that this person gains a sense of security somewhere else, they will blow off that relationship faster than you can blink. This is the opposite of true friendship, as it's a guarantee that the minute you find another way to feel good and safe, you'll abandon your commitment to relating to this person as if they were a part of you, and you'll start to play a zero-sum game instead. So, that's point one. Point one. Make absolutely sure you actually do want to be friends. Two. Get it completely out of your head that success in a relationship means longevity. Now, those of us who observed our grandparents should already have learned this lesson by now. Even if most people would wish that their relationships would last happily ever after, some relationships are just not meant to. This means we need to keep this a desire, not a fixed expectation. So much of the pain of breakups is about how we thought it was supposed to go versus how it did go. And there are all kinds of reasons for someone to enter your life or play a role in your life for a time. Longevity is not the definition of a successful relationship. Plenty of people are able to maintain perfectly miserable relationships with colleagues, with partners, with family members for years upon years and even until they die. I'm sorry, that is not success. 
That is not success of a relationship. The definition of a successful relationship is a relationship that enhances the well-being and growth and happiness and fulfillment of both people involved. It feels like a win-win. A healthy relationship is positively interdependent. At this current time in human evolution, all relationships face times of conflict. They face times where it feels less good than other times. But forcing yourself to stay in a relationship that is not actually adding to your well-being because your idea of relationship success is longevity, that's a surefire way to have a really miserable life. And also, it's not a successful relationship. Also, it's perfectly possible for two people to have real genuine love for each other and a real relationship and for that relationship to come to a point where it needs to transition. We have these concepts I've noticed within modern society that the way to know whether a relationship is real is if it lasts or to, whether to know that love is real if it lasts. In my opinion, this is an incredibly damaging belief that we have. It's also based on fairy tales. There is no good reason to devalue a relationship once it ends. There's no good reason to consider it a mistake once it ends. But this is our tendency. Once we break up with someone, we immediately devalue the relationship. That fast. The fact that we base the value of our relationships on how long they last is not reflective of the reality of their value. Instead, it's reflective of our desire for them to last. Here's the thing, from source perspective, some of the most valuable relationships you have had in your life are with a person you sat next to on a train one time in your life and never saw again. <laughs> Three, do not expect a transition in a relationship that will be without pain. Of course, this is the best case scenario, <clears throat> but it's not particularly um, reality driven. <laughs> A lot of people want to transition a relationship from a partnership into a friendship because they just want to avoid pain. They think that doing that is going to make it so they don't feel any of it. I have never found this to be the case. Human beings are absolutely predisposed to bond. We create these connections with other people and that becomes our security. That becomes our emotional home. So obviously any time there is a disturbance or a disruption or a threat to that emotional home, it's going to cause fear. It's going to cause pain. What we want to go for is the commitment to decreasing pain. It's the commitment to ensuring that there isn't a rupture in the relationship. Prepare to face whatever pain does come up, most especially painful patterns within yourself, and to consciously face it together. After all, if there were no pain inherent in the situation, breaking up wouldn't be a consideration in the first place. That being said, a breakup is an opportunity to completely rewrite your life. It's an opportunity to start new and create a new life that is in alignment with your highest personal truth and desires. Four, relationships don't end. They never end, even if you want them to end. <laughs> this is what I mean by that. Let's say that everything goes absolutely horribly in a relationship and you want nothing to do with this person and you break up with them. Unfortunately, breaking up with them didn't make them cease to exist. Maybe it just turned them into an enemy instead. So now, instead of the relationship being that you're partners, the relationship is that's an enemy now. So, get it through your head. Relationships never end. The point of conscious uncoupling or creating friendship after breakup is to try to do this in a way where you have a positive relationship coming out of it instead of a horrifically negative one. The fact that relationships don't end is why most people who are conscious choose to do this and not call it a breakup, but instead call it a transition or a passage or a shift or an uncoupling. So anytime a relationship is changing, it is an ending. The question is, what is it changing into? Your goal should be to get very clear about specifically what you want it to turn into instead. And if possible, get on the same page with the other person about that vision so you can work towards it together. Five, it is not always possible to do this process of consciously breaking up with somebody so as to remain friends with them on the other side. And this is why, and it's going to depress you. It takes two. Now, you'll hear a lot of people say it takes two to ruin a relationship. It's not actually true. See, if I form a connection, which is what a relationship is, it only takes one to break that connection. But if I'm trying to make a connection and the other doesn't want to do it, I can't do it. 
So the reality of relationships is it takes two to maintain the connection and only one to break it. If someone unconsciously decides that it serves their sense of self to make you the enemy, they have stronger motive to create a typical lovers to enemies breakup than to transition the relationship lovingly. I need you to get that because a lot of people, especially people who take hyper responsibility of situations, think that as long as it's in their court, they can always create a perfect relationship with somebody. That's complete illusion. However, everything I'm presenting in this video is going to increase your odds exponentially. And even if you're the only one who's doing any of this conscious attempt to transition the relationship to something positive, that's your highest bet that the other person's going to reciprocate. Six, a relationship can look however two people decide they want it to look. We live in a society that has incredibly fixed and rigid ideas and rules about how things should look and should be. And in order to do this kind of transitioning process, you got to get way the hell outside of that box. Obviously, this box that people have for how relationships should look, it's different from culture to culture. But I'm going to give you some examples. We have an idea that a sexual relationship should be between two people, maybe even some cultures, a man and a woman only, and that's it. We have the idea that we need to live in single family households with only immediate blood family members and anything else is dysfunctional. We have an idea that if two people break up, they need to get away from each other and stop talking. The time has come to really question and potentially break these fixed and rigid rules about how things should look. Our well-being as a species, in fact, depends on it. The way you're going to restructure a relationship and what you're going to transition it into is going to be completely unique to you too. You should structure your relationship based on whatever most enhances your well-being. Here's an example. When myself and my ex-husband decided to break up, we decided that it would be in both of our best interests to stay living together. Another couple might decide that it isn't, and it would be best for them to transition into different living arrangements. It's perfectly fine either way. One couple may decide to end their sexual relationship. Another couple might decide that what's in their best interest is to open the sexual relationship to other people. Another couple may actually decide to not be sexual, either of them, for a certain period of time. One couple may decide that what's in their best interest is to take a break from each other where they're really not texting and calling each other for a defined period of time. Another couple may decide that even though we're going to split up, we're going to call and talk to each other and text every day still. What I'm getting down to is there is no one perfect way that makes this uncoupling process successful. Transition slowly and carefully. There is nothing that damages your intention to create a positive relationship with somebody than transitioning something suddenly, immediately, and especially if both parties are not perfectly consenting to it. For example, let's imagine that the breakup is happening because one person in that relationship wants to be free to explore the world and doesn't want to have the burden of having to have anybody else to think about. And the other one wants a really committed partner who's really there and who wants to be with them all the time and even start a life with them. Obviously, this is an incompatible type of a desire. But if these two people want to remain friends, this person who wants freedom can't get on an airplane to go climb Mount Everest the next day. It's not going to be possible to create a transition that actually works if that sudden and immediate change occurs. Sudden loss and sudden change creates a severing. It is this severing that creates shock and makes it so we can't cope with the adjustment. Do what's necessary for both of you to feel ready and take each step that needs to be taken. That being said, you can't use what I've just said as an excuse to stall or to keep someone trapped in the current relationship. And that is a temptation, especially when we're so terrified and in a state of avoidance of all of those painful things which are associated with the transition. In other words, transitioning slowly and in steps is not a way of keeping the other person locked into the relationship the way it was. It's a way to ensure that there will not be rupture in the relationship, only change. Here's how I'm going to explain this. The process of a butterfly emerging out of a cocoon is a slow process, and it's a deliberate process. If you were to just rush in and remove the cocoon immediately, you'd probably kill the butterfly, in fact. Do you want to do that to your relationship? No. Eight, breaking up or transitioning the relationship is something that is going to 
trigger your insecurities. Therefore, it's going to throw you into a place where you feel vulnerable. Therefore, it's going to put you in a space where you're in defense. All of your defensive strategies are going to be employed at this time. Why does that suck? Because those defense strategies are the very thing that destroys connection and relationships. Usually a breakup causes us to feel like something is bad or wrong about us. It causes us to feel shame. We reason that if we were not bad or wrong, a person wouldn't be breaking up with us. So to save our own self-concept, we deflect that shame and begin a kind of ping pong match over whose fault the breakup is and who is the bad guy. To understand more about this, I want you to watch my video titled Deflection, the Coping Mechanism from Hell. We have to avoid doing this if we want to stay close while transitioning the relationship. The key to successfully transitioning relationship is about trying to stay in the vulnerability instead of in the defenses of that vulnerability. Take a good look at your defenses. What are they? Some of us shut down and withdraw. Some of us get angry. Some of us might bypass. If we want to transition well, the key is to stay in the vulnerability instead of in the defense of that vulnerability and share that vulnerability with each other. Anytime you're going through a transition like this, you would greatly benefit by having somebody outside the relationship who can actually support this process and support you through it, especially relative to your vulnerabilities and insecurities. That being said, I actually disagree with the majority of experts who talk about how to transition relationships in this way. Most experts say that it's a good idea during a breakup to take care of your own feelings, not each other's feelings. Now, I think that while it's incredibly important to take care of your own feelings and to get support for those feelings, it's very important actually to support each other's emotions during a breakup. The couples that I see do this process the very best are polite, thoughtful, generous, and respectful of each other and take care of their own feelings, but they do this with the other person as well. In other words, they share and support each other's vulnerabilities through the transition. For example, let's say that during a breakup you hit a wave of grief. Now, you might feel inspired based off of the insecurities underneath that grief to say something like, I cannot freaking believe you had an affair. You lied to me. Now, the other person's going to automatically react back. This is the ping pong match I was talking about with something like, yeah, well, you were never freaking there. This is not the way to go about supporting each other's emotional states through any kind of breakup. So let's give you the alternative. Vulnerability is, when you had an affair, I felt like I'm never going to be good enough for anyone. That's what I'm the most afraid of actually going forward, is that I'm never going to be good enough for anyone. This opens the window for the other person to support the vulnerability and even offer their own vulnerability so you can reassure them instead of defend themselves and cause a rupture in the relationship. The bottom line is you need to support each other through the vulnerabilities of that breakup. Instead of play a game of who's right and who's wrong, who's good and who's bad. Most of the time in breakups, we're defending our own goodness and rightness by making the other person bad and wrong. And there is no possible way to turn that into a friendship, is there? That's a zero-sum game. A big part of vulnerabilities that we feel during a breakup is the meaning that we're assigning to the experience in the first place. We need to bring this meaning that we are assigning to what is happening to the other person instead of simply making those assumptions. To understand more about this, watch my video titled, Meaning the Self-Destruct Button. 9. We must take loving care of our rage, resentment, and hatred of the other person that might crop up during this painful transition. All of these emotional states that I've just listed arise from pain. When we feel hurt, it's an automatic self-preservation reaction to slip into a space of hatred. We use hate to stay connected to a person. It simply becomes a negative bond instead of a positive one. We also use it to attempt to justify disconnecting and maintain our positive self-concept, but doing so actually causes heartache, to root itself deeper instead of resolve. For this reason, I strongly encourage you to watch my videos titled Hatred, The Secret Cause of Hate, Why Love Turns to Hate, Resentment, How to Let Go of Resentment, and Forgiveness, Radical New Approach to Forgiveness. Also in a breakup, we may find ourselves slipping into self-hate. If this is the case, you would benefit by watching my video titled Self-Hate, the Most Dangerous Coping Mechanism. Rage, which is another emotion that's destructive to trying to create a friendship, is very common when it comes to transitions in relationships, especially romantic breakups. 
Now, the thing is that rage is not the destructive creature that you think it to be. In fact, it is some of the strongest motivational energy that exists on the planet today. And one of the best things you could do with the rage of a breakup is to channel it in the direction of making a conscious commitment to never have the same thing happen again. Instead of channeling and directing that rage towards the other person, channel it directly towards making changes in your life. You can use rage as an energy to transform your beliefs, thought patterns, and behaviors and actions that contributed to the pain of the relationship and led to the breakup in the first place. Many of you may have experienced not really being motivated to do shadow work before, but when you get into that state of rage, now that may be the very energy you need to do dive after dive after dive to make sure that that pattern never comes up in your life again. 10. In most breakup situations, if not all of them, the people in the relationship feel as if it's the other one's fault. Both of them feel this way. This fault-finding process really doesn't take you anywhere. Even if it seems like a single person did compromise the relationship, wouldn't it seem that underneath all of that dynamic was an incompatibility to begin with? After all, what would make you enter into a relationship with somebody who disconnects in the first place? A good way to stay away from this fault finding is to actually directly face the incompatibility that is at the root of these breakups. For this reason, it would greatly benefit you to watch my video titled Incompatibility, a Harsh Reality in Relationships. Incompatibility is not about someone being right or wrong, it's about the difference in who we are and what we want. The thing is, when we're incompatible with somebody, we don't tend to accept that incompatibility. Instead, we look at the differences between what we want and the other person wants, and we make them wrong for what they want. We make them wrong for who they are. Obviously, this is just going to backfire. Now, like I said again, incompatibility has nothing to do with who's right or wrong. You're totally fine for wanting what you want and being who you are. It sucks if you're in a relationship that isn't really a match to that at all, but it still isn't either of your fault. This is actually what the Irreconcilable Differences Clause is all about. So what makes a relationship really safe post-breakup is that both of you are consciously looking at the incompatibilities and deciding what to do about them. When you have a friend in your life, for example, and you're having a breakup with them because there's incompatibilities in terms of the friendship, this is really what your safety is all about because you're not going to be having a friendship afterwards. What is going to happen, though, is you're going to find a different type of relationship other than a friendship that's going to be compatible to you both. It's going to feel good to you both. You're going to be doing the highest and best possible thing, given the fact that friendship is no longer an option. That makes for a safe relationship. Speaking of all this, taking responsibility for your part in whatever pain may have existed in this relationship or what led to the breakup is critical when it comes to this process of parting ways or transitioning the relationship. If we take responsibility, it actually triggers the other person to do the same. It also empowers us because as much as it may suck to see, we can see the ways that we have been the source of our own suffering, and therefore, how we can change that so as to not repeat the same pattern again. No matter how badly the other person behaved, we still have the capacity to look at any contributing factors that we may have added to the situation, or even to why it occurred in the first place. Now, I'm going to get aggressive with this. Even if your partner is 98% responsible for the breakup, you still need to look at the 2% that you had anything to do with. The reason is, is because that's the only thing you have control over. Don't confuse this with finding fault with yourself, blaming yourself, or sliding down the road into shame. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to step into the empowerment of taking like genuine responsibility for what your 2% even is in that situation so that you can make a change so it doesn't occur in the future. Become infinitely more committed to developing yourself than to defending yourself. 11. Stay as far away from zero-sum games as is humanly possible. Now, I did a whole video on zero-sum games. I suggest for you to understand deeper about this to watch my video, quite literally titled Zero-Sum Games. The thing is, is that most of us, when we're in a relationship with somebody, meaning they're my friend or they're my partner, this is the only point at which we're even willing to consider not playing a zero-sum game. And what usually happens the second a breakup happens, and any family court system can tell you this, is that they're like, well, screw you, you're not a part of me anymore. I'm going to freaking fight for my rights. 
and then it becomes a zero-sum game. That is an absolute 100% guarantee that there is no possible way for you to have a friendship afterwards because you are establishing, I am not interested in your best interests, I am an enemy. You must take the other person's best interest as a part of your own best interests. What makes a relationship safe post-breakup is deciding together what to do given the incompatibility inherent in the current arrangement so that you can find what is the highest and best option for the both of you. Communication is absolutely critical for this to actually work out. Most people are not psychic. They can't just intuitively know what your best interests and needs and desires are. This means you must communicate them, and the other person must also communicate them, so that even if it doesn't feel like a win to break up, you can arrive at the next best win-win scenario for the both of you. A new relationship implies a new set of agreements. So what this means is, is that any changes you make, any expectations or promises, they have to be made around this concept of what's in the best interests of both of you. 12. Surround yourself with people who can and will be on board with what you are trying to do. This is really important because why? Society in and of itself sees breakups as needing to be a certain way. And so the way that people in your life tend to support you through any kind of breakup is to be like, oh, that person's a bitch. They'll basically turn you against the other person to establish a sense of rapport or loyalty to you. It's instantaneous triangulation. If you want to maintain a positive relationship with that person, you cannot let that happen. This means try to get your social circle on board with what you're doing. Relationships are part of a larger network of relationships. When a relationship needs to transition, it impacts everyone in that social network. This means do not begin to triangulate against the person. While it's tempting to cushion the impact of a breakup with other people's validation for how bad the other person is, it makes it almost impossible to transition the relationship to something different and to keep your intertwined social groups intact. This means... Tell them they don't need to take sides and act like they don't need to take sides. Establish your solidarity with the other person in the face of your social groups. Also, give them the philosophy that you're coming at this with. See what you can do to get them in alignment with helping you guys to do this transition instead of in opposition to this transition. When people turn against somebody that you are breaking up with, it can provide temporary relief and validation for separating, but it creates long-term scars and pain. This means limit your exposure to these people until you feel strong enough to not be affected by them or their opinions. Choose to be around people who will be advocates for holding that space where both of you are still close, just in a different way. Choose people who will help you to choose the right arrangement for your both, no matter how unorthodox that arrangement may be. This means surround yourself with conscious people who are genuinely dedicated to integration and connection and a sense of social peace. 13. Make amends and generous, loving gestures that will establish that sense of rapport with the other person and that will demonstrate that you care about their best interests and that will put to rest any bad blood between you. You have to have the intention to resolve anything that's unresolved so that you can move forward into a different and a better type of relationship. The feeling that you're trying to go for with this one is a sensation of completion. So relative to this particular relationship, what needs to be amended or changed or resolved in order for us to feel the sense of completion so that we can move forward to creating something new instead? What would actually help to repair the damage they did to you or you did to them? You can't undo the past, but you can learn from and correct mistakes. Take steps to clean up what has happened and establish a totally different way of doing things moving forward. 14. Figure out where you do align and make that the new foundation of the new relationship. When we are in the middle of a breakup or a transition of a relationship, all the focus goes towards where we don't align, where there is incompatibility. To create the new relationship, the focus has to be entirely on the opposite side of the spectrum. For example, alignment may be wanting to be family members still, or it may be the shared goal of being lovingly united co-parents, or it may be a specific hobby, or it may be a common world vision. Then you focus on and build your relationship and make decisions and agreements with this area of alignment as your focus. Your new relationship will begin to mutate around that. To give you an example, a couple that I coached really loved sailing. This was everything for them. It was the whole basis of why they met in the first place. They had a young daughter as well. When they broke up and they decided they didn't want to be partners anymore, 
they still decided that what united them was this love of sailing and also their daughter. So they decided to keep their beach house and their boat together. And they decided that every single weekend they were going to go out with their daughter together as a united group. And that they were going to alternate on holidays who used that beach house. It was a perfect arrangement for them. It was an arrangement based on where they did align. 5. Create a conscious transition or uncoupling ceremony. Ceremonies are important rites of passage. You can let this be incredibly emotional. Let it be touching. Let it be reflective of the both of you. Again, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Whatever ceremony you create together should be completely unique to you or the other person, or both of you, if you have the opportunity to do it together. We have ceremonies for weddings and funerals and coming of age and promotions and significant holidays. The process of transitioning a relationship should be no exception. This paves the way for healthy closure and a new beginning. Make sure you do this, if you're doing it together, when both of you feel ready. Our long-held assumptions about breakups are false, even though it is incredibly difficult for us to hold cognitive dissonance, and that means to hold both the good and the valuable and the not so good and painful at the same time. This is the reality of our relationships. It is possible for us to recognize the value that we get out of somebody and the incredible things that being with somebody added to our life, while at the same time recognizing the pain that makes it so that a change has to occur. If we can do this, and we're really committed to the development of a more evolved, more conscious, more safe type of society, then I can tell you that this conscious transitioning of relationships is the wave of the future. I personally commend you for taking a step in the direction of this culturally creative change. It is possible for us to allow breakups, to break our heart open to a life of more love, a life of more authenticity, a life where we are really living the life that we are meant to live, and relationships that are in fact more secure than they were to begin with. To end this episode, I want you to be thinking about your transitions of relationships, your uncoupling or your breakups like this. To begin with, your relationship is like an intact piece of pottery. When it breaks, you are now looking at these pieces to consciously uncouple or consciously break up or change a breakup into a friendship, you have to look at all of these pieces like a mosaic. Once you put them together in a new form, they will be infinitely more beautiful than they even were to begin with. Have a good week.